Hello, welcome to the HVMFC YouTube channel. What I would like for you to do is like and subscribe. Have a blessed day. Coming up on The Inspired Word. When you are called to God's purpose and you are doing what God has asked you to do, the enemy can't lay hold of you. There's nothing he can do to you. He can only watch the blessing at work because you are the blessing at work. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hello Harvest Village family, Pastor Charles here with a quick reminder of our mission, which is to seek the lost, teach the found, and send the disciples. To continue to reach our community and people all around the world, I invite you to join us by financially partnering with us on our mission. To do so, go to www.harvestvillage.org slash give. Thank you. Hello family, and welcome to Harvest Village Online. I'm Pastor Charles Miles, and have an awesome message prepared today. Switch your Bible, your pencil and paper, your notepads as we get ready to get started. Today we're going to pick up in this series, Disruptive God. Today's topic is, do you have the heart to take over occupied spaces? And I'm going to start here with a story, but as you go in and open up your Bibles, going to start with 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 18, we'll be picking up at verse 6. So 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6. But first, this story. I, I remember when I first went to Arizona to play football, and I was, you know, it was a blessing for me and my family. I was blessed with a scholarship to go play ball there. And I remember how I was recruited. And when I was recruited, man, you know, one thing they do a good job of when they're recruiting you is making it all about you. You know, of course, making you feel special, making you feel like, you know, you're that guy, you are the one. The coaches make you feel good about everything. You know, almost like when you get there, man, it's going to be all about you. The crazy part of it, when you accept that scholarship and you actually go there for your first day, that first day of camp, that first day, you know, you got to sign in and check in amongst all the other fellas, you know, you find out you're not as special as you thought you was. You know, and what I simply mean by that right now, they already got you. The coaches, you know, you have already committed to that school. You are there and you showed up. Now they just treat you like one of the other fellas. They treat you like one of the athletes. And they have about 125 on that field. So when you got this many athletes on the field, of course you got a lot of people that plays your position because there's only 11 positions on each side of the ball. So whether your offense is 11 or defense is 11, so to speak, right? Now, I'm giving you this thought process because when I showed up and I realized I, I came into that running back room, I finally got it on the inside of my head. Wow, there are like seven or eight other dudes that play my position. I was a fullback, which was the bigger back of the two running backs. And then when I was there, I said, man, we got this many people playing fullback? It, it kind of blew my mind, you know, and, and so then we got a chance to go out to the field. I realized, you know, there were guys that were faster than me. There were guys that were bigger than me. And at that time, when I came in as a freshman, there were also guys that were stronger than me. And so at first, you know, I had to get my mind wrapped around that because it kind of threw me, you know, threw me off a little bit. Because once again, I, I thought I was going to be that guy coming in the game. And so then, once again, I was good enough for them to give me this scholarship. The coach said I was the primary, you know, one when I was being recruited for this position. But here I am, once again, amongst these guys now, and I realized I am probably not the best there. It, it struck me on the inside of me. I remember kind of that night, that afternoon, thinking to myself, when I see these guys, some of these guys are bigger than me, stronger than me, faster than me. But you know what? Nobody has a heart like I have my heart. I mean, nobody has a heart within them. In my mind, like I have heart on the inside of me. I know what it takes to be tough. I know what it takes to be strong. I know what it takes to be, you know, have that mindset to go out and take it. You know, I mean, nobody's going to give it to you. And I already had that portion in me. I thank God for that, right? But it was something because I had to get over the mindset of, you know what, I'm coming here. You know, and I, and I believe God had blessed me with this scholarship. And I know he did because he gave it to me. At the same time was I realized I have to come over and take over these occupied spaces. Simply meaning was there was people there when I showed up, but this was my job. I was going to get it. I was going to take over and I was going to become the starter, but I had to go after it. And the reason I'm bringing this up today with you family, because see, literally a lot of times when God is going to send you somewhere, he's going to send you to a place that the 
uh, the place that you're going to, the position that is there for you, is going to be occupied by someone else. Now, a lot of people may think to myself, man, that, that may be kind of difficult because, you know, what do I do when I'm in that situation? I'm going to tell you what you do in that situation. You have the heart to stand. You, you have the heart to take that job. You have the heart to go in there and know that that position is yours, so no, no matter what it is. So I'm sitting there, this young 18-year-old kid out there playing his 19, 20, 21, 22, even 23-year-old young men, right? But I knew this position was mine. So much so, I, I remember coming into camp and I was doing a great job in camp. And, and, and here I am now. I, I was just on the, what you call the, oh my goodness, this is terrible. I can't even think of the name. I was on a scout team. I was just the primary scout running back when I first came, came in. A lot of people, they do like that because, once again, they have already people starting. They already have their second string. And usually they already have their third string. But now me coming in, I was like, this is not, you know, where I'm going to stay. So here I am going from, from scout team. Okay, I remember the coach coming to me the, I think it was the second week, the second week of the season. He, then he comes to ask me, Charles, we actually want you to play this year. And I thought to myself, man, that's, that's awesome. You know, I'm getting ready to play. And I remember the game I was getting ready to play in was the Illinois game. And I'm telling you right now because there, all these people who were in front of me who were supposed to be doing great at their position, they needed me now to come in because the way I was playing, they wanted me to come in and start playing and even take some of the starting role as a fullback. And I thought to myself, man, how blessed am I? But I knew I had to have the heart to do the job that God had called me to do. But that didn't start that week. That started when I came in. That started with the right mindset. I couldn't look at those people and think they, they were better than me. Yes, some were bigger. Yes, some were stronger. Yes, some were faster. But I couldn't look at that at all. I knew I was the best. And because I knew I was the best, I had to come in there and do what I had to do to take over. And I'm giving you guys this thought process right now, once again, because sometimes God is going to give you a blessing, but that blessing, you have to go through something to get that blessing. If you don't go through something, you won't get that blessing. And I think about this, I think about this even here with King David, King David and Saul. Well, before I go there, let me finish off the story. Now, he asked me literally to play on a Monday of that week, and I have never forgotten it. Because what happened to me on Thursday of that week, I actually got hurt. I got hurt real bad, too, and it put me off about five, five or six weeks of the season. But it's something how I prepared myself to take over. It's something how I prepared myself to be in a position God, I believe, you know, literally gave to me. But I had to know on the inside of me that that was my position to take hold of, to lay hold of, to put my hands on, to grab it, and to know it was mine. Next year when I came in, yes. I came in, I was one of the starters. I mean, I, I played my butt off that, that, that my uh, redshirt freshman year when I was able to be healthy and to be strong. And I played for the next few years at that position. I'm saying all that because of the examples we're going to talk about today is when God is giving somebody a blessing, when God is giving you a position to lay hold of, you must understand you can't cower. Because if you cower because somebody else is there, if you cower because you think somebody is better than you, if you cower because you're in fear, okay, of taking hold of what God has planned for you, you'll never get the blessing that he has given to you. And so I want to talk about David and King Saul this morning because I want to talk about when God anointed David to be king, okay, there was somebody already in that position and his name was King Saul. And I'm bringing this up because if you think about this right here, you'll understand what all the things that David had to go through. But David had to have the heart to go through everything he needed to go through okay, to obtain the position that God had blessed him with. How many of us, how many of us have the heart okay, to go into an area okay, that's already occupied by someone else or something, so to speak, to, but to do, to sit there, to, to, do, to, to stay the course and know what God has given you, you will receive. How many of us have the heart to stay there? How many of us have that, that heart on the inside of us to be who we're supposed to be? Okay, all of us need to have that heart. But God will check us. God will see if we're ready to go in there and take, take hold of these things. Amen? Amen. So let's pick up here in 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6. And let me just set you up right now. Like I've already told you. David, king, uh, David has already been anointed okay, to be king over Israel. But Saul is already occupying that position as king of Israel. And what's getting ready to happen right now, David has already defeated the giant uh, Goliath. And so David has already done some wonderful things. And David is even out there now fighting some of the military battles that Saul is sending him on. And he's being very successful, very victorious in these areas. 
And 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 6 picks up. It picks up, it says, as they were coming home, Okay, when David returned from striking down the Philistine, the women came out of the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with songs of joy, and with musical instruments. And the women sang to one another as they celebrated, Saul had struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very angry, and, saying, and this saying displeased him. He said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed thousands. And what more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day on. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul, and he raved within his inner house. He raved within his house when David was playing the lyre, as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled his spear, for he thought, "I will pin David to the wall." But David evaded and evaded him twice. Now think about this for a moment. David knows he's been anointed king. Okay, and the Lord sent him to work in Saul's house, meaning He sent him to work within the kingdom, right under King Saul. Now, Saul is jealous about this because David has been doing some wonderful things. You can clearly see David is blessed and backed by God. Okay, when he goes against Goliath, David does this wonderful thing by killing his giant, right? Of course, he did this with the Spirit of God upon him. But I'm giving you this thought process because, see, Saul knows David is, uh, I'm sorry, Saul knows God is working through David mightily. Now, David's out there doing all these military things, you know, fighting these battles and doing all, having all these great victories. And Saul sees all the success that David is having. So it's difficult for Saul because Saul can feel like the Lord has left me. And now all of a sudden he's with David and David is doing these wonderful things, these great things he's up to. But now, Lord, you know, what about me, so to speak, right? So Saul is having one of these moments in what's taking place is he's becoming jealous of David. He's becoming jealous of David so badly that he, when he feels he has an opportunity to kill David, that's exactly what he wants to do. So he took his spirit and he literally threw it at him, even though David had done nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, David wasn't even, wasn't even against King Saul, if you guys can remember. David actually loved Saul. But Saul was always going after him, attacking him, you know, chasing him in the wilderness, chasing him through the mountains, ravines. I mean, all these things King Saul was doing to David. And David wasn't doing anything harmful to, to Saul at all. But if you get this on the inside of you, David also knew that God anointed him to be king. Okay, David had to go through all this hardship, all these difficulties, because he knew what God had placed upon him. He couldn't run from it. So he, had to, he had to stay the course. He had, he had to stay in there, hang in there, even though these people were talking about him. Even though these people, you know, were sitting there saying uh, um, false things about him. And I'm getting this over to you guys today because, see, people do the same thing with us. Okay, the devil works the same way all the time. And what I simply mean by that right there, when the devil is trying to take you away from the blessing of God, Okay, he'll use anything he can get to go against you. You know, he'll come against you by people talking about you. He'll try to get people to, to take you out, so to speak. You know, he, he this is his ways, guys. And so, you know, sometimes we've been sitting there and we wonder why all these things are happening to me. And we sit there, we've been praying to God. You know, you, you told me you gave this to me. God, you delivered this to me. But the problem is, you know, the people who are there right now, they're coming after me. But don't you understand you are more than enough when you have God on your side? And that's what we got to get in the story. That's what we got to get on the inside of us, kids. Because when God is giving you an occupied space, all you're doing is just waiting for your turn. That simply means God's going to clear the path for you. But do you have the heart to stand when you need to stand okay, and not run when things get rough? And that's all of us. All of us have to think like that. All of us have to be in that mindset. You know what? I have the heart to do what you called me to do. Even if people are throwing spears at me, even though people are attacking me, even though people are coming after me, God, I am, I am going to lay hold of what you blessed me with. Okay, I'm not going to give it away. I'm not going to walk away from it. I'm not going to run because I know this is for me because you blessed me with it. And that's how exactly how we have to think. Look at 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 12, the next verse. So verse 12, it says, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but he had departed from Saul. So Saul was doing all these things, okay, because he knew David was blessed. Don't you understand? People will come after you because they see the blessing on your life. They don't even understand sometimes why they're coming after you, but they just can't stand you because of the blessing that God, God has put upon you. And that's okay. That's okay. It's not okay they come after you. What I'm simply saying to you is, you know what? Recognize Satan and his evil works for what they are. 
Okay, and unfortunately, he works through people who do not know how to guard their heart. He works through people who do not know how to shield themselves from his actions. And, and these people are coming after you. They're doing these things to you because they see the blessing that's upon you. It is somehow the enemy will try to attack you, okay, when they see the blessing upon you. Because they don't want you to lay hold of that position. Because they know when you get in there and you're doing the work of God, you know, they're going to be downcast. They're going to be downturned. They can't do the work that they were doing no more. See, sometimes folks are being called to go into certain companies and certain leadership positions for a reason. The reason they're being called to come into these companies and these leadership positions is because, see, God needs his people in there. People who are ready to behave like God would have to behave. People who are ready to do the right thing by God. And when God gets you in there, you know, that thing is going to change. Okay, there's this whole, you know, sometimes, you know, he puts you as the head because he needs the other these other false leaders to fall. He needs these people to be shaken up, you know, and get out of there. He needs you to come in and reset some things. He needs you to come in there and make things how he would have it. And that's why you've been called to this position. So you cannot cower. You cannot run. You cannot go back at the, the back the other way. You must do what he's asked you to do. Amen. 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 And please get this on the other side of you. It says Saul was afraid. He also was afraid. Isn't there something? When people are afraid of the blessing upon you, when people are afraid of, of, of the person you are, even when people are afraid of you, you know how they, they will come after you, they'll secretly come, come, come after you. You know, they, they'll start doing things, saying things that are false about you. You know, they're trying to put you out there before others. You know, it is crazy to me how people, when they see people start talking about people all the time, how they, how they can sit there and go with the crap. How can you sit there and believe all those lies? You have never heard me say one thing about anybody. And all of a sudden, you know, people are talking about you negatively. When, what do you know about my character would, that would lead you to believe what they say about me? You know, and it's something, because get this. You, when you realize that people will talk about people behind their backs, don't you also understand they're going to talk about you behind your back? See, right now, they're just, you know, they're just your friend. Right now, you may be their confidant. But you better be so careful about that because just like they turn on others for no reason, don't you also know they're going to turn on you for no reason? So you gotta stop listening to folks like that. You gotta stop taking it in, taking in people who sit there and talk behind people's back like that. You know, if they're doing that, once again, they'll do it to everybody. And here it is, King Saul, once again, going back to scripture, he was afraid because he saw the blessing. But the beautiful thing about the Lord, the Lord will sit, will allow you to be blessed. Okay, he, he will allow you to be seen by your enemies, okay, why you are being blessed. Okay, why your cup runneth over, so to speak. You know, I, I love that scripture in the 23rd Psalms. You know, right at the end of the scripture, I have, he says, he sits there at the table. Okay, he's, he's, the anointing is upon him, but his enemies are seeing him. His enemies are seeing him being blessed by God. And God will not tell you to run from your enemies. God is not telling you to cower in any way, shape, or form. Matter of fact, he wants the enemy to see you blessed. Because what that allows the enemy to know is that you are not greater than God. You are not greater than his protection. You are not greater than anything he puts in place. Okay, and Satan, he gets to see this all the time because those who are blessed by God, the enemy cannot touch. Now, I, I realize, you know, all of us, even we give in our life to God, we are blessed. But then when those who are called according to his, who his purpose and we are living his purpose out loud in our lives, guess what? That's when the Lord puts that blessing and protection upon us where the enemy can't do nothing to us. He can only watch us being blessed. And that's what you are today, family. This year, as we go forward, I want you to recognize, okay, when you are called to God's purpose and you are doing what God has asked you to do, the enemy can't lay hold of you. There's nothing he can do to you. He can only watch the blessing at work because you are the blessing at work. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I wanted to pick up with this first story of King Saul and David because I wanted you to think about, you know, the, the, these occupy spaces and how you go in and lay hold of them because when you really get on the inside of you for you to lay hold of this thing it's going to take heart you, you have to have a heart we still have this saying in, in, in football and I've never forgotten it you know when we come to game day when, when we get ready to play against another team you know we we don't know these other people out there you know we may have seen them on film but we don't we don't know who they are and sometimes you know we may think these guys are bigger stronger faster also right but we would go in and and, and the fellows would actually say, we know, you bring your heart with you today? Did you bring your heart with you today? And, and I love that. Well, that simply means, you know, today we get ready to go out here for a battle. We get ready to go take, take this field. But as we go out here on this field, you know, you better make sure you have your heart ready. 
Because if your heart's not ready, you're getting ready to cower in this game. If your heart's not ready, you can't play this game. If your heart's not ready, you're not getting ready to go in here with your team and be successful. So you have to have your heart ready. That's what it's about. In, in every area of, of this Bible, okay, I, I see men and, and women who have to be faithful. They have to have the heart to do what God has called them to do. There's a scripture in the Bible talking about the Israelites where we're getting ready to go. We're getting ready to cover them a little bit. But, you know, it, it, it says, the Lord has tested you these 40 years in the wilderness he tested you to see what was in your heart. I love that scripture because he tested you to see what was on the inside of you. Could you go through this? Could you stand your ground? Could you be the people I have called you to be? Could you be the person I have called you to be? See, God is testing your heart. See, it's something how we view heart. Or we know we, we, how we view we for God. See, God looks at us being consistent. God looks at our obedience. God looks at me, you know, when I call you to do the hard things, are you going to run and turn the other way? When I call you to do the difficult things, you know, are you going to stand? Are you going to move forward on what I ask you to do? Or are you going to quit? Will you decide not to follow me no more? See, one thing about our Christian faith, we will be tested. We will have trials and tribulations. We will have difficult seasons in our lives. But will we cower and go back to where we came from? See, I, I need you guys to understand right now, as I'm speaking to you guys, you know, we must have the heart to stand. We must have the heart to move forward on what God asks us to do. We must have the heart to be the men and women he's called us to be. You know, and, and I think about all this right here because what happens to a lot of us when we go into these battles, we go into these struggles, we think we're alone. Okay, God would never send his child alone into a battle. He just doesn't work that way. There's no way in the Bible where he says that or he does that. When God goes with us, we know that we are more than enough when we are with him. I think when I was a young man, even a teenager, a little boy, you know, I was one of those kids. I, I was been blessed with a big family. And they got, you know, in his family, five boys, four girls. And I think about my brothers a lot, and I think about my dad. You know, sometimes I'll get into instances, you know, that were bigger than me, you know, folks trying to jump on me or do something to me, you know, unfortunately, and, on, on, in certain instances. But, you know, because I had these brothers, you know, every once in a while I had to, hey, you know, you need to come over here with me today because this is about to go on, you know. And, then, and these brothers, what they would do was they would back me. So I, I didn't have to walk in fear. When I became a young man, you know, it was some instances, and I, and I was pretty good sized young man, so most things I could handle on my own. But I think about... When things got real bad, when things got real tough or, you know, something really caught me off guard. You know, sometimes I had to call the big dog in. The big dog was my, was my dad, you know. And when I, you know, had, I very rarely needed him in that kind of area. But every once in a while, you know, it was bigger than me. But I knew I could depend on my dad because if I had to call my dad, my dad already knew it was a serious thing. And the beauty of my dad was I knew he was coming. I knew he was coming. And that I wasn't going to be alone. And, and, I, and I was blessed. I was blessed in that. I, I, I was blessed in, in, in knowing my dad moved like that because I always knew I could count on my dad. If things went bad, you know, but hey, I knew my dad would show up and things would change. And that's how we have to feel about our Heavenly Father. You know, our Heavenly Father is there for us to call on. As a matter of fact, He doesn't even expect for us to do this alone. He already knows what's going on. But when you make that call, so to speak, you know, He's already behind you. He's already for you. But God forbid. That's how I feel about people right now. God forbid. Don't make, don't make me get my father involved. Because you're not going to be just dealing with me no more. And you're dealing with Him and He's all powerful. You know, and I love that about our Lord, that He's ready to show up. He's ready to be there, and he'll never leave us nor forsake us, meaning that he's always with us, always for those who love him and those who, who keep him, those who, who fast him. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. So I want to pick up here. I want to pick up here in Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. And the, the, the point I'm trying to get across right here in this portion is I want you to see how God will give you these occupied spaces. Okay, but I also want you to understand when he gives you these occupied spaces, here we are again. He's getting ready to show off. There's people in this occupied space, but God is getting ready to move them. He's getting ready to move them on your behalf. And sometimes they don't take place overnight. Sometimes it takes place through seasons, you know, it takes place, you know, months, years. But I want you to understand you're getting ready to go in and that's getting ready to be your place. It's getting ready to be your position. It's getting ready to be your business. But I, you have to be faithful. Faithful to go through this with the Lord. Amen? Amen, amen. Exodus 3, chapter, uh, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 3, verse 16. This is God talking to Moses. 
He says, go and gather the elder, elders of Israel together and say to them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me, saying, I have observed to you and what has been done for, to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pesarites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. So right now, God has, you know, given Moses, has given Moses the understanding that I'm getting ready to take your people from bondage to the promised land. And I love this right here because, see, sometimes we've been going through difficult seasons in our life. We've been going through seasons where, where, where we've been had so much, you know, we feel like we've been in turmoil. We've been in prison. You know, we've been in that bondage, so to speak. You know, but God is getting ready to deliver us. He's heard our cry. He's heard our prayers. And now he's getting ready to answer them. See, once again, guys, sometimes the Lord allows us to go through things that we become stronger. See, sometimes the Lord allows us to go through things so we can come mighty in other, in other areas of our lives. Meaning we learn to trust him. We learn to believe in him and to, and to know that he will be with us when we go through these situations in our lives. And that's exactly right now where the Lord is getting ready to take the Israelites. He's getting ready to bring them from a state of slavery to a state of freedom. And that's where he's getting ready to go. Now, I'm going to pick over this right here or go rather to another scripture. We're in Numbers. Numbers, we're going to wait in Numbers chapter 13. Because the Lord gave them the promise in Exodus 3. They let Moses and the people know about it. But now in Numbers 13 is when they get ready to go into the promised land. Okay, the Lord's getting ready to push them there. So in Numbers chapter 13, verse 1. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you should send a man, every one a chief among them. So right now, God is getting ready to send them over. But I want you to see the land in which you're going to. Now, I wonder sometimes why God didn't just go in and start the battle. Why did he allow them to see? A lot of times when I look at this right here and I look at scripture, a lot of times the Lord allows us to see things because he wants us to know where we're at. And this goes to the scripture, you know, we walk by faith and not by sight. Don't you understand, family, or I need you to understand, rather, a lot of times our sight is deceiving when it comes to things of faith. See, our sight can tell us what's there. It's the same way with the doctor in the, in, the, in the doctor's office, right? The doctor tells us what he sees. That's what a doctor is good for. Okay, a doctor tells everything usually what's going on with the body. You know, that's what he's good for. But see, but when you walk in by faith, is the Lord saying, are you going to trust in me? Or are you going to trust in what you see? Because they can only tell you what they see. But I'm going to tell you what I know. See, that's the beauty of God. God tells you what he knows, and we must understand what the Lord knows is what's supposed to come to pass. But you, if you believe more in what you see, you get what you see. Did you understand that? When you believe more in what you see, then you get what you see. See, it's, it works the same way with faith. If you believe and you trust in God and have enough faith in him, okay, then what, what you have faith in will come to pass. See, God wants you to hold on to what you have faith in. Okay, what you have faith in, not what you see. Because your sight versus your faith. See, your sight deceives your faith. So you can't hold on to what you see. Okay, you must have faith in God and trust in what you know. Amen? Amen, amen, amen. So here they are. These spies are getting ready to go spy off the land. As they go see the land, they see the good, bad, and different in this land. Now they come back to get this report. And this is in Numbers 13. Numbers chapter 13. Let's pick up in verse 25. It says, at the end of the 40 days, they returned for spying out the land. And they came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him, we came to the land to which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey. And this is the fruit. Mm. So what they know now, what the Lord said is true. I'm giving that to you right now. What the Lord said was true. I love this portion of it right there because, see, they had, they had heard about this land, but they had never been there. Okay, but now that they had showed up, now that they had seen it, they understood what the Lord said was true. The problem is what they saw was more than what they bargained for. And that's what they get ready to talk about right here in verse 20, 28. Because what they bargained for was the land not being occupied. What they bargained for was this land with all this blessing there, with all the fruit of the land, all the vegetables, all the, you know, the, the, the fruit and honey, so to speak, of the land. They expected nobody to be there. See, I wonder sometimes when we go into positions or we go into places, why do we expect nobody to be there? We have to ask ourselves that question, right? When we go in to start this new business, didn't you realize somebody was also doing this business? 
Did, when you go in and take a layover of that position, didn't you, all, all, didn't you already know somebody was in that position? So if the Lord is telling you this thing, don't you understand he's already put a plan in place okay, to help you, to put a plan in place for removal, so to speak, of the other person? Don't you know he put a plan in place to bring you to a position that you're supposed to be in? Okay, the Lord is the one that makes the plans. A lot of times the problem we have is we ask how. How is this going to be done? Because when we start asking how, how has the ability to kill our faith? How has the ability to make us stand still and or go backwards? So we got to be so careful of how. Because you're trying to figure out how to do it in your own power when it's not you that's actually doing it. It's God putting you in place. Okay, if God didn't tell you to go, then you shouldn't go. So if you try to do this on your own, then that's on you. But when God is putting you in place, when God is anointing you for a position, don't you understand God is the one that's going to set it up for you. God is the one that's going to sit you in that chair, so to speak. God is the one that's going to bring it to pass, not you. Why do we try to get in this way when he has given us uh, this blessing or this, this position in our lives? we got to be so careful of trying to make what God puts in place happen. It's no more different than Abraham and Sarah, you know, sitting there having a kid that God promised him. Okay, God didn't tell you, Sarah and Abraham, to do it that way. Okay, you guys were the ones that tried to do this on your own. God said he was going to bless you with a child. Will you trust in him? He said the child will come from your body, Sarah. See, will you trust in him? Or will you sit there and bring Hagar into a place and a position where she should not be? And there was so much that did not have to happen. But because they tried to make God's plan work on their own, their way, okay, they caused so much confusion. Okay, that confusion still can't come, comes to this day, right? It's still here this day that, where that confusion has led us. But I'm, I'm giving you this thought process, this thought process simply because when we do things like this right here, we, we, we cause confusion in our lives. We cause something that didn't have to be. Why? Because we were trying to take over God's position. Let God do what God do. You know, it says, let go and let God. Let God handle it. Let God put it in place like he needs to put it in place. So let's not be the authors of our own confusion. It's a problem like that. So many big problems like that when we do things like that. We author our own confusion and we blame God. We blame God for it. You know, even a little bit there with Sarah and Abraham, you can see how Sarah was even blaming Abraham for that child. Sarah, you brought this lady to me. Now, Abraham shouldn't have went along with the plan, but I want you to give you this thought process, right? We alter our own confusion, and we're even, when we're trying to figure out why are we in this position, why are we in this place, sometimes we even blame God for it. God had nothing to do with that. Okay, we did that on our own. Okay, that's not the place we were supposed to be in, amen? Amen, amen. So when God has given us something, okay, allow God to put us in a position and a place in which he, in which he wants us to be, amen? Amen, amen, amen. So let's pick up here. I'm going to pick up in verse 28. It says, however, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amorites dwell in the land of the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the hill country. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. Uh-oh. Remember, God sent the leaders. He sent the leaders of every tribe. Okay, when the leaders came, they saw what God promised. They saw the land flowing with milk and honey. But they also saw something that they didn't think was going to be there. They saw people. As a matter of fact, some of these people, when he's talking about the descendants of Anak, he's talking about, we saw, we saw giants there. These people were big. They were not small. You know, it, they were also there. And see, the problem is the leaders could not see God's vision. The leaders did not move in faith. Only two leaders actually moved in faith, and that was Caleb and Joshua. Now, I'm giving this over to you because, see, God, we know God punished the Israelites before their lack of faith. Is something, I want the wrong leaders in place. The wrong leaders can lead you down a path where you should not go. And I wanted to point this out right here because, see, sometimes we're trusting so much of our, in our leaders, but you don't understand these leaders are not following God. These leaders are not trusting in God. So it's difficult for us to follow them. The beauty of it, I want you to see in this right here, even concerning these leaders. When God gave them 40 years of punishment to stay in the wilderness to the old mindset died off, okay, these same leaders, all of them died in the wilderness except the ones who believed, which are Caleb and Joshua. Okay, Caleb and Joshua, okay, from the, that whole older crew, Okay, they are the only ones to walk into the promised land okay, with the younger people. It was simply Caleb and Joshua. I'm giving you this thought process because, see, when God is asking us to step, in, to step up and step out, 
Okay, he's calling us right now to be the head, not the tail. He's calling us to be leaders. Okay, and as leaders, we must trust in God, even more so than some, some of the other folks. Why? Because God is using you to lead them. See, when God is giving you a position of leadership, you must understand it is a privilege, it is an honor that he's giving you that this position. Okay, and you cannot waste that privilege and honor because when you waste it, okay, you don't trust in God. And, and even though he's giving you this blessed position, okay, God then must get rid of you. Okay, he must remove you and put somebody else in your place. And I want you guys to lay hold of that today because God has been trying to use some of you guys to lean. God has trying to, been trying to use some of you guys to step in, to step up rather than step out, to do what he asked you to do. But he can't use you if you're not going to trust in him. And yes, as a leader, he's going to, he's going to take you through certain things. Okay, there's no way to get around it. You know, either you want the privilege or the blessing of being a leader or you don't. Okay, but if you're going to be purposed by God, you have to, you have to allow God to, to bring you to a place where, you, you know, he can develop you, where he can use you. Because if you refuse to be developed, he can't use you for the position he wants you to lay hold of. Amen? Amen, amen. Now, let's, let's go here, here to verse 30. Numbers chapter 13, verse 30. It says, But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are able, we are well able to overcome it. And I love his, it's like confidence here. We are well able to overcome it because Caleb knew who he was with. Caleb absolutely knew who was backing him. See, it's something. Caleb, you know, just in remembrance, these people had just walked out of slavery, walked, walked out of bondage out of Egypt. Okay, God has done all these wonderful things for them. Okay, God, and you know, these wonderful miracles. Remember, every miracle in Egypt, God did on his own. Okay, the people didn't have to fight. The people didn't have to do anything. Okay, they just have to watch God work because God absolutely did that on his own. Okay, so Moses to announce it. Moses or Andrew do this one thing and God put the miracle in place. That's exactly what he did. Now, there's a little bit of a difference here. Okay, as the people got to watch God and the power of God at work, once again, they didn't actually fight. This is important because now what God is getting ready to do, okay, he, the people are going to get ready to go in, but they got to go lay hold of the land. That simply means they got to go in there and fight for what God has given them. Amen. And that's what I really want you to recognize about King David and King Saul. See, King David had to fight for what God had given him. There's a difficult thing to understand. Why do I have to fight, Father, for something that you have given me? Well, why do I have to, you know, why is it just not something I can walk into? See, if God is using you to fight for something that he's given you, okay, God wants to give you an understanding. God wants to bring you to another level. He's trying to develop you to understand not all things you're going to go into that I tell you that you can lay hold of are going to be free for you. Are you willing to do what I ask you to do to get to where you want to go? See, some people, unfortunately, some people don't want what they say they want. And you know they don't want what they say they want because they're not willing to pay the price for it. It's no more difference even talking to children, so to speak. You know, I, I've had times and, and I'm talking to my kids and I'll say, you know, they say, Dad, I want this. Dad, I want that. You know, Dad, I, I may want this pair of Jordans or Dad, I want this right here. And it's something I'll say, well, you know what? If you really want those Jordans, you know, I, I know you got some money saved up or got some money that you've been putting up. You know, why don't you pay for half the shoes? If you pay for half of it, I'll pay for the other half. Or say, we, we pay for a third of it, and I'll pay the other two-thirds of it. You know, and it's something how sometimes they'll come back and say, well, I, I didn't really want it. I, I, that's not really I really wanted. I'm good. I don't want it anymore. Why? Why didn't they want it? Because, see, they weren't really, they didn't really want to sacrifice for it. Okay, they only want, they just wanted to come free. And it's something how people are like uh, adults. See, I expect one thing from kids, but I expect another thing from adults. See, it's somehow people say they they willing to pay the price for it until they realize you have to sacrifice for it. See, it's a sacrifice that's a hard thing, right? When you have to go in there and fight for something, that's the difficult thing. And sometimes you don't really want what you say you want because you're not willing to sacrifice or fight for it. And that's what's going on right here. The people of Israel, they're sitting there praying to come out of this bondage and, and praying to come into this own place, their own place, so to speak. And God is ready to deliver them. But the problem is, they're not willing to fight for the land that God promised them because it wasn't free. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? See, we have to check our hearts here. All of us do. Every person that, that, that loves the Lord, every person, even if you don't know the Lord, you have to check your heart. You know, you, do you really want what you say you want? Do you, do you, are you really willing to go after what you say you want to go after? You know, I, I want to lose weight. You want to lose weight? There's a sacrifice that must be made. Okay, you have to work out. 
Okay, you, you, you don't have to, you know, cut back on the table. You have to do some things that you don't naturally want to do. It's not easy to lose weight and keep it off. You know, it, it's easy, you know, maybe lose 10 pounds, 20 pounds here and there, but you gain it all back because the mindset hasn't changed, right? And, and the problem is with that, if you really want something, are you willing to sustain a sacrifice? Are you willing to change your mindset, willing to ch change, you know, who you are on a daily basis to maintain that sacrifice? See, when you go into something, and it's not free, there's a cost that must be paid. Are you willing to pay the cost? We used to have this old saying, it costs to be the boss. You know, it's something. And when you're in a position, position of leadership, there's a cost that must be paid. You know, the greatest amongst you must be servants, right? So don't, don't, don't think when you're a leader that you're going to be served. No, no, it doesn't work that way. When you go in and you're going to be a leader, you must be the greatest of the servants. Okay, you, you must take on that role. You know, be careful of the privilege and honor which, which is impressed upon you, what God has given to you. You see, some of us should not, say, you know, to literally reject it. Because if we don't have a heart to do certain things, we don't have a heart to be for God, then, Lord, it's not for me. It's not for me. The truth of the matter is because if you accept it, can you come into it, you're going to be judged more harshly because of it. Say, it talks about it in the passage, right? Many of you should not be teachers of the law because you'll be judged more harshly. That's what it says of us. So if I'm going to accept the call that God has put on my life, if I'm, if I'm going to accept the blessing that he gave me, if I'm going to accept the privilege and honor that he has you know, given, impressed upon me, then guess what? I'm going to be judged more harshly because of it. So that's what it is. That's it. There, there's nothing else to be said. Anytime you're put in a place to be a leader, anytime you're put in a place to be used by God, right? anytime you, you, know, you step up and answer the call, guess what? You're going to be judged more harshly. That's just what it is. Okay, if you reject those things, then, hey, reject the position. Reject the position. That's all. That's all. Because if you see right here, these leaders that were called, these, these, these leaders over, over these people, they never made it in. They never made it in. As a matter of fact, they deceived the people. They brought these people. Unfortunately, bad leadership, bad leadership can bring people to a bad place. These leaders who, who sit there and failed to trust in God, what they did was, they sat there and they let any, everybody that was 20 years or older, okay, they helped them to die in the wilderness. They never made it into the promised land. That's exactly what happened. I mean, this is a difficult circumstance, right? This is tough here, but it's real. That's what happened. Bad leadership is bad leadership. Bad leadership can lead you into a pit. Bad leadership can lead you into a grave. So that's why when you, we call to be a leader, make sure you answer the call. Okay, make sure you respect the honor and privilege that's uh, impressed upon you. Make sure you do what God has told you to do. And last and final, make sure you trust and have faith in God. Amen? Amen, amen. So let's move forward. Let's move forward. Let's go to Numbers 13. Let's go to verse 31. So next verse down. Next, Numbers 13, 31. It says, Then the men who had gone up with, uh, with Caleb had said, We are not able to go against these people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, The land... Though which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people that we saw in, the, in it are great, of great height. And there we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Adnan, who come from the Nephilim. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seem to them. Now, here, we, here it is again. The leaders, the leaders that were sent, they're sitting there not trusting in God so bad. They're trusting in what they see. So many of us, since birth, unfortunately, we've been taught to trust only in what we see. And the problem is with that right there, we've never been taught to have faith or trust in God. And when you haven't been taught to have faith and trust in God, what tends to happen is what you see is always 100%. Because it, that's the, the problem. Guys, the difficult portion is then how do you have faith? If you only trust in what you see, we know our God can do things supernaturally. Our God can do things miraculously. And they're not going to be based in things in which you can see. Because they are out of the natural. Your sight is a natural thing. Your sight brings just natural things into your understanding. But when you're, ha when you're having faith, what faith does is bring the supernatural, okay, into the present. What faith does is bring the supernatural, okay, to build you up. That's what faith does. Okay, so you can believe in God's report versus the world's report. We can believe in God's report versus the doctor's report. Once again, the doctor not, is not trying to deceive you because the doctor is telling you what he sees, but God is telling you what he knows. So when you trust and have faith in what you know by God or when you believe only in what you see. See, these guys here were, were only believing in what they see. And because they believed in what they see, it deceived them. 
So you can't lay hold of the promise of God if you don't have no faith. We can lay hold only of the things of God by faith because God is a rewarder of those who what? Have faith in him. Period. That's the way it works. That's scripture. 100% scripture. So you can only lay hold of the things of God by faith, not based on what you see. So that's the biggest problem they had. See, the problem of the heart here is they say they were ready to go to the promised land, but they weren't ready to go lay hold of an occupied space. See, family, right now, I want you guys to understand this. God will give you occupied spaces, but you have to have the heart on the inside of you to lay hold of that occupied space. See, the Israelites, they missed out of this occupied space for 40 years. Okay, they would have went in because they would have went in with God. Okay, God would even have developed them in the promised land. But I want you to understand, because they just pushed back so hard, they had no trust, no belief. They had no trust, no belief, even though they saw, they had seen, they had walked through the Red Sea, split in half. They had seen all these things. But they couldn't trust God. They couldn't trust God. And the problem is, family, is that they were not ready to fight. Hear me? They were simply not ready to fight. See, one thing about this right here. God did everything for them in Egypt. So even though they had just walked out of Egypt, okay, because they had to go in with God, Okay, God didn't do everything. We won't do everything on his own. He was going to sit there and, and teach them to fight, teach them the war, teach them, you know, develop them. They weren't ready to do that. They didn't have the heart to do it. We know later on, they, they, they gained that heart in that wilderness. They sure did because they went in, they started fighting, they defeated every tribe, okay, even in a bigger area that they were supposed to occupy. They defeated every, every nation that was there. They went in and fought their butts off and was, you know, <laughs> defeating people left and right. Unfortunately, it took them 40 years to get there. And what I'm trying to get over to you right now, see, sometimes we have not laid hold of God's promise that he has given us because we weren't ready to fight. The question I have for you guys today as I get ready to end this sermon, are you ready to fight for the occupied spaces that God has given you? You have to, you have to ask yourself this. If you still have breath in your body, you, you, there's still purpose for you. Other than that, God, you would already be with him, so to speak. See, but I need you to understand right now, some of you, this moment, have not laid hold of the position of the place, you know, of the occupied space that God has given you. Is it because you haven't been willing to fight? Ask yourself that and be honest with yourself. you got to be honest with yourself. Because, see, if you get that on, on the inside of you and you recognize, Father, I am ready to fight. I'm ready to go in and lay hold of what you have promised me. Get to praying. Get to talking to him. Maybe he can turn something around for you. I know he can. All power to him. Amen. But you must be ready to occupy the space that God gives you. Okay, don't allow your disobedience. Don't allow your, your unfaithfulness. Allow you to roam in the wilderness, so to speak, until you die. Amen, family? Amen. Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name this morning. Just thanking you for who you are. I thank you, Father, that you help us to trust you, help us to lay hold of your word, mighty God, of your wisdom, your understanding. Thank you, Father, for teaching us to be better. Thank you, Father, for all the things that you promised us. Help us to lay hold of the things, mighty God, that you've given to us through your word. You know, health, wholeness, mighty God. Help us to walk and live in prosperity. And what I simply mean by this, not just money alone, mighty God, but be prosperous in every area of our lives, our relationships with our children, mighty God. Help us, mighty God. Help us to understand your word. Help us to know you, Father. I thank you, Father, for you are the great deliverer. You are our banner, our leader. I thank you, mighty God, that you are our provider, our healer. Help us to know you better, Father. Help us to love you better. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you, Father, for continually speaking through us. In Jesus' name we pray. We say amen, amen, amen. Take care, family. Have a blessed day. Have a blessed weekend. See you later. Bye now. If you are the sound of my voice this morning and you want to know Jesus Christ for the very first time, Romans 10 9 simply states that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. So if that's you this morning, you want to meet Jesus for the very first time, simply declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And if that's you this morning, you now belong to the kingdom of God. That's the first step. But there's a powerful second step that you must take. Okay, it's the second step is your transformation to become a disciple of Christ. 
Okay, for you to transform, you have to pick up the Word of God and start reading it, start taking it in. To get with a good Bible-based church, so people, the people there can help you to become the person that you're supposed to be in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you can't find nobody in the area in which you're in, you can always find us at HarvestVillage.org. Okay, you can email us at admin at HarvestVillage.org, and that should be on the bottom of your screen. Admin at HarvestVillage.org. Amen. Amen. For any reason you may have stepped away from the Lord. Okay, and you're looking to come back. And 1 John 1, 9 simply says the Lord is faithful to forgive all those who ask for forgiveness. So repent. Turn away from what you're doing and turn back towards God. Ask for forgiveness. The Lord is ready to put you back in your rightful position. Amen. Also get with a good Bible-based church as they continue to help you to find the Lord okay, and walk in His truthfulness. Well, family, that's all I have for you this week. Thank you for joining me this morning. Okay, thank you for listening to the Word. Thank you for studying the Word. And have a blessed day, family. Thank you.